Puerto Rico's lower house has confirmed Pedro Pierluisi as Secretary of State. Mexico has opened the first shelters for migrants who are sent back from the U.S. And another two cases of Ebola have been confirmed in the border city of Goma in the DRC. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Puerto Rico's lower house of Congress has confirmed Pedro Perlisi's nomination for Secretary of State. This comes just as a disgraced Governor Ricardo Rosselló is set to step down at 5 p.m. local time. The lower house voted 26-21 to confirm Pierluisi, but to become the island's next governor, he still needs to be approved by the Senate. Nonetheless, the Senate delayed the hearing on Pierluisi's nomination until Monday, leaving widespread uncertainty about what will happen once Rosselló steps down later on Friday. And earlier in the day, Puerto Rico's lower house questioned the would-be successor of Governor Ricardo Rosselló. Among the main questions Pierluisi answered was of whether his eventual appointment as the new governor would represent a conflict of interest given his past role as representative to the U.S. Congress. To answer directly, no, I don't anticipate having any conflict of interest because my role in public service on this occasion is not of a legal nature. I am not going to be functioning as an attorney. Rather, it has more of an administrative character. As a matter of fact, I'll say this. When I was resident commissioner, I inactivated myself in legal practice, and it was I would also during my public service on this occasion. In other words, I'm not going to be performing as an attorney. And to respond to your question, I don't anticipate, irrespective of what I did and didn't do for the control board as an attorney, I don't anticipate a conflict. Earlier, we connected with journalist Jai Fonseca for some insight into how things are looking on the island. He said that people are waiting the magic hour when Rosello claims he will officially resign. You're making the question here. We really don't know. There's there's no way to know because now a lot of people are thinking, and it might happen, that the governor can just not resign at all. And before 5 p.m. Puerto Rico time, and I guess Venezuelan time as well, um, he might not quit at all because until confirmation, no one knows the succession process. So right now, the governor is supposed to resign at 5 p.m., and we'll have a new governor at 5.01 p.m., but we are not quite sure of that. For a period of about two weeks, Puerto Ricans took to the streets of mass demonstrations. We asked if things have yet calmed. But if the governor decides to stay, then Presidente and other people from the media here are calling to the streets. They're making that call. So it can increase in a minute. So we really don't know. Maybe at 5 we we'll have a better understanding, but right now at 12 something, no, we're not quite sure what's going to happen at 5. Moving on, the Mexican government has opened its first shelter in the border city of Ciudad Juarez to house asylum seekers sent back from the United States to await their asylum process. According to officials, the shelter can house 3,500 migrants. Similar shelters are set to open in the coming days in Tijuana and Mexicali, and that there are plans for another one in Nuevo Laredo. Under the Trump administration's so-called Remain in Mexico policy, the U.S. has reportedly returned around around 200,000 asylum seekers to wait in Mexico since January. We would also like to tell you that in this effort we are going to provide a series of services to help the migrants, providing them with shelter, food and medical attention. Finally, the most important aspect of this migrant integration center is aiming to be the bridge for the asylum seekers so that they can access the labor market and in doing so they will join the workforce of Ciudad Juarez. Eastern Llano Basin communities delivered a report on Thursday to the transitional justice system in Colombia detailing human rights violations committed by paramilitary groups, military forces and the members of the former FARC guerrilla movement. The report was delivered by the victims of both legal and illegal armed groups and sought to unearth the truth behind what happened in the Eastern Plains. 
It was delivered to the Truth Commission, the unit for the search of disappeared persons, and the special jurisdiction for peace. The report narrates present-day criminality against the implementation of territory control in the region. It focuses on executions, disappearances, and displacements. The report essentially compiles the voices of the victims of the Eastern Llanos Basin. Magnolia is one of the many victims of this armed conflict that, after 18 years, is still looking for her daughter, who was recruited by the FARC guerrilla group. She hopes this report will help her find out what happened to her daughter. I would really like to know the whereabouts of my daughter, or at least have her remains given back to me. And if she's still alive, I would love to meet with her and recover so much lost time. 18 years have been stolen. We haven't received any kind of information about her. They took her away when she was eight years old. The guerrilla recruited her in the Guaviare camp. I would really like to know what happened to her. They can either tell me to collect her bones or they can let me know if she's alive, because I've spent many years looking for her. The victims hope that the human rights violations that occurred in the first decade of the 2000s are unveiled under the implementation of the famous democratic security policy established by former President Álvaro Uribe Vélez and under the development of the military cooperation plans with the United States. We have to start from the top. Who exactly sent the lower-ranking military officers? They received their orders from high-ranking military officials. Let's find out who they are so they can be investigated and made to pay for these crimes and forced disappearances. In the Eastern Plains alone, there are 2,304 cases of unidentified persons being buried from which 1,674 were reported as discharged in combat by public forces, and only 221 bodies have been delivered to their families. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has fired the head of a commission which was charged with investigating murders and disappearances that happened during the dictatorship. Speaking at a news conference on Thursday, Eugenia Gusta Gonzaga said she had been removed as the head of the commission alongside four other members of the seven-member body. The removal comes a few days after Gonzaga rebuked Bolsonaro's comments mocking the disappearance and murder of Fernando Santa Cruz, a leftist activist during the 1964-1985 military dictatorship. For us, this removal was an answer to our declarations defending the rights of the Santa Cruz family and all the relatives of former members of resistance movements. We speak of barbarism. Not handing over the body of victims killed by the state is barbarism. But the situation of playing with the version of what happened is cruel. Bolivia is celebrating the Day of Agrarian and Community Revolution as a way to decolonize thinking and unite in the fight against racism and imperialism. And on this day, President Evo Morales visited the Department of Cochabamba to participate in the launching of a program which will extend electricity to 152 rural communities in 11 municipalities. Extending power throughout the country has been top priority under this administration, which says that basic services are a human Human right. In 2005, 67% of Bolivia had electricity. Under the leadership of President Evo Morales, the number has grown to 93%. In 2005, when we became a government, the internal demand was 700 megawatts in the whole country, and we produced about 900 megawatts, leaving the demand of the production almost the same. And from that, 100% was in private hands, and it didn't belong to the Bolivians. Once I said that by year 2025, we would be generating 6,000 megawatts. And after I said it, one of the ministers said the president was crazy. If we take the electricity from all the plants along the Rio Grande River alone, we have 6,000 megawatts, and plus the 3,000 we already produce, we would have 9,000 megawatts with a demand of only 2,000 megawatts. 
We have a surplus of energy, and when we said that Bolivia should be the energy center of South America, we weren't wrong. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Two new Ebola cases have been detected in Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to health workers, the wife and a baby of a man who died due to the virus have now presented symptoms. Meanwhile, the DRC Ebola response coordinator has appealed to the residents not to panic as necessary measures are being taken. More than 1,800 lives have been lost since the epidemic broke out on August 1st of last year. One of the recommendations is to ask neighboring countries not to close their borders, so as not to hinder the movement of people and goods, and that was clear. The way people cross borders doesn't guarantee the best control yet. We need to strengthen our control at the border posts we just visited. Also see what Rwanda is doing on the other side and modernize the way we control people who cross, who go to Rwanda. Presidential candidates in Tunisia have started registering for the polls in September, called after the death of President Beji Kaid Essebi. Eight candidates have submitted their papers to the country's electoral commission. The prime minister has not yet officially registered, although his party on Wednesday said he would stand in the polls. The elections were originally scheduled for November. We are committed to enter the battle with strength, with the strength of our programs, the strength of our will, and with the strength of the population that believe in us, and the strength of the team that is with us. We have finished the procedures and we will start touring Tunisia. We are delivering the message to all Tunisians. Try to choose intelligently. Try to vote for people who have competencies, credibility, for their program and their abilities to apply their programs, as some will not be able to execute their programs. Zimbabwe's finance minister has announced an increase in electricity tariffs during the presentation of the supplementary budget. He also says there will be food distribution to both urban and rural residents affected by the drought, among other measures. The country has been faced with drought and power shortages this year. The electricity tariff for domestic consumers uh, will be increased from an average of 9.86 cents per kilowatt hour, which is about 1 US cent, to an average of 27 Zimbabwe cents per kilowatt hour, which is three US cents per uh, kilowatt hour. Government has distributed 189,000 metric tons of grain uh, since January now, and, and, and this is supporting 757,000 households. The beneficiaries, and the beneficiaries for the first time are in both rural and urban areas. In Sudan, demonstrators filed the streets of the capital in condemnation of the killings of several school children during a protest in El Obeit. At least four high school students and an adult were shot and killed on Monday by what many believe was the doing of the military and paramilitary forces. It sparked this and other massive demonstrations. Nine members of a paramilitary group have been detained in connection with the killings. The demonstrators are continuing to call on the military council to hand over power to a civilian-led government. We demand a civil state, a state that protects us, a state that has sovereignty, a state that has rights. The Sudanese people should be ruled by a civilian government. This is why all people came here to demand a civilian government. Everyone here is demanding rights, their rights. They don't belong to the government. Everyone is demanding a civil state, and the civil state will hopefully be achieved. The Ethiopian Prime Minister has justified the government's move to shut down internet services last week, saying it was done to save lives in the wake of a coup attempt back in June. Speaking to journalists in Addis Ababa, President Abiy Ahmed said the internet is not water, internet is not air. He has also warned that if people use the internet to incite the killings of fellow citizens and to destroy property, then the switch off uh, button could be long term. Internet and text messaging services were first shut down earlier in June when national school exams were being held to prevent cheating. 
Sevilla. Mohamed Gassawani has been sworn in as Mauritania's president after winning the June 22nd presidential elections with 52% of the votes. Outgoing President Mohamed Ould Abdelaziz handed over power to Gassawani in front of supporters who turned out to witness the first peaceful transfer of power since the country gained independence in 1960. I am proud to belong to this homeland, and I thank the majority of the people who were convinced by my speech during the election campaign. I also thank the citizens who voted for other options. I understand the significance of that. In the end, I am the Mauritanian people. The Mauritanian people, along the epic line of democracy during the elections, stress the vibrance of the political system of Mauritania. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt has announced a $444 million tax-free budget. In the three-hour presentation, he announced a removal of taxes for a wide array of items, ranging from vehicles to diapers. PM Skerritt, who is also Finance Minister, noted his country has made significant strides since Hurricane Maria battered the island in 2017, causing $133 million in losses. He also reminded legislators that after the storm, no one except him wanted to take the lead to commend the island's rehabilitation process. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has sworn in its first female governor general. Susan Dugan, officer of the British Empire, made history on Thursday. She is an educator and holds a master's degree in curriculum and evaluation from the University of Southampton, Berkshire, England. Former Governor General Frederick Ballantine has a demitted office due to health reasons. Trinidad and Tobago will be seeking the help of legal agencies in the United States and the United Kingdom to provide information on the role British data mining company Cambridge Analytica played in the country's 2010 general elections. Attorney General Faris Alwari made the disclosure of the heels of a, net, of a Netflix documentary series called The Great Hack, which looked at how CA utilized Facebook data without users' knowledge. The mutual assistance and cooperation in criminal matters is to be deployed via the Central Authority Office in the Attorney General. And secondly, the recommendation to the Parliamentary Committee to treat with the preservation of privilege and disclosure of privileged material received by the House of Commons and the US Parliamentary context is to be recommended by way of AG writing to the Parliamentary Committee. And still in Trinidad, a controversial bail bill was passed without amendments in the House of Representatives on Wednesday night with the support of the opposition. All 32 members present, present voted for the bill, which required a three-fifths majority. The bail bill seeks to deny bail for 120 days to a person charged with a listed offense that is punishable for a term of imprisonment of 10 years or more. The bill proposes that we bring our bail amendment laws into keeping with what is the currency of bail restrictions and bail considerations in the Commonwealth. To do this, Madam Speaker, we come now and we say in the law that we effectively wish to consider the situation of a restriction on bail in effectively two circumstances. The first circumstance is if you have a conviction for a very serious type of offense listed in the second part to the schedule, which is contained in the schedule to this bill, if you have a conviction for a serious offense there and you have a charge for that same type of offense in the schedule, you ought not to be considered for bail. The bodies of 20 migrants who died in a recent boat accident in the Mediterranean Sea have washed ashore the Libyan town of Koms. Dozens of people are still missing after the boat carrying more than 300, 300 migrants capsized off the coast of Libya on July 26. About 134 were, re were rescued by the Coast Guard and local fishermen. 
Small explosions left four people injured in Bangkok, Thailand, as the country hosts the regional summit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The explosions took place near the center of the city and in the northern part of Bangkok, near the government's complex. A total of six exploded bombs were recovered by police with one more unexploded device also found. Thailand's foreign minister is due to hold a news conference at the conclusion of this 52nd Asian foreign minister's meeting. And finally, Britain's new Prime Minister Boris Johnson suffered a, a first serious blow to his leadership on Thursday when his ruling Conservative Party lost a seat in Wales, cutting its working majority in Parliament to just one. The seat in Brecon and Randershire was won by Jane Dodds, the candidate for the Liberal Demo uh, Democrats. Dodds overturned a majority of more than 8,000 votes to beat Conservative Chris Davies. The by-election was triggered when Davies was unseated by a petition following his conviction over a false, a false expenses claim. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesfreenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.